Good morning, everybody. I'm Patrick Duffy, and I'm very excited to be back in the beautiful NASDAQ studios overlooking Times Square in New York City. Today is part five of our series, Future Thinker, that runs in tandem with Design Pavilion, an annual event celebrating design and architecture in the heart of New York City's Times Square during the NYC by Design Festival. Our series explores how agents of change, disruptors, and leaders in the design industry will shape tomorrow and what they are doing today to make a positive impact on people and planet. My next guests focus on supply chain, transparency, and making a positive impact. Lanvi Wen combines a design house with a co-op supply chain to produce high-quality fashion and consumer goods while providing economic freedom to artisans in Vietnam. Her organization, Fashion for Freedom, works directly with villages and small producers to share in the profit of collective labor and investment with the goal of, of achieving systematic change. Dr. Leonardo Bonani is a globally recognized innovator in supply chain and transparency and traceability who created an open source platform that connects people across the global community of supply chains. Millions of users from multinational brands, manufacturers and material suppliers and farmers use his platform to trace supply chains and measure their impact on the triple bottom line. It's extremely exciting to have both of you here. Welcome to NASDAQ. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Yes. So you both work in supply chain in different ways, but I'd like to understand, Leo, let's start with you, how you do it and tell us a little bit about what the source map platform is. Sure. Uh, you know, uh, six years ago when the Rana Plaza factory collapsed in Bangladesh, a lot of the brands that had business there didn't actually even know that uh, that facility was being used to make their clothes. And um, basically at SourceNet what we do is we make sure that that never happens again. We allow multinationals to map their supply chains all the way to even the farmers and measure the impact socially and environmentally through some pretty innovative software. Where, that's a good question. Where did, this, where did the idea come from and where does the software come from? Look, uh, I realized uh, ever since I was a kid and we kept hearing these scandals in the news about uh, child labor or deforestation that uh, global supply chains are a mess. Right? And a lot of the things that uh, we benefit from, the products we buy, are made in conditions that we would not want uh, the people we love to be living in. Uh, and so I decided to connect those and effectively uh, with the rise of social networks that became totally possible. So if we can talk to each other halfway around the world about uh, what we're having for breakfast, why can't we know exactly how the people who make our clothes are, are living, where they're living, uh, the practices that, that those brands are supporting. So why then is transparency so important with what you do at SourceMap? Look, there's two sides of it. One is as a consumer, I want to know that the products I buy are being made in ways that I support, that mm -hmm. support my values. Uh, the other one is if a brand doesn't tell you where their products come from, very likely they don't know. They're not even measuring the impact. And, and that often means that there are much bigger problems waiting to be discovered. Mm. Lanvi, over to you. Tell us about your unique model and how you work with artisans in the supply chain. Uh, from a standpoint of our, our infrastructure, we as far as the supply chain, we, we are quite different. We, we're trying to provide an alternative supply chain. Right? Tell us about that, yeah. Um, it's basically, uh, we, years ago, you, you talk about globalization, like making it bigger, bigger is always better. You reduce your costs, et cetera. But you also have increased risk, increased waste. When, when we looked at where the uh, rights of worker and really the, the, the basics right, I believe that there are ways of helping them to um, earn the rights to be an entrepreneur. In that infrastructure sounds very much human rights, mm -hmm. but in reality, it's a really smart way to produce because now you've minimized your risk. Mm -hmm. You create um, a framework that allows you to be creative, that allows you to be nimble, and allows you to sample and prototype much faster. Mm -hmm. And we found that by creating an infrastructure where we can gather a lot of smaller players, but do it virtually and, and create it within our ecosystem, we're able to help big brands turn around good ideas much faster, especially in a market where there are so many copies, or so many copiers, <laughs> and therefore so many copies that it, it's, uh, sometimes it's, it's exhausting mm. to think of a new idea. Where well, the best new ideas is actually looking back and seeing old traditional skills and seeing what can be made mm. from that. And we've, we've missed that and we've lost that for a little bit. So this is a resurrection of old craft 
to modern with modern design. That's amazing. Can you get a little bit more granular and talk to us about how you work with the artisans? Because they essentially are the seeds of the supply chain. Yes. Mm -hmm. So from a from a standpoint of a supply chain, and I have to tell you the truth, it was um, it, it was a, a a process of fumbling through the darkness. Mm. <laughs> I call it accidental. And, and it's it's because initially going into Vietnam it was it was the intention of me um, investing into the traditional uh, conventional supply chain of you big big giant factories producing uh, mass product because uh, as, as a finance person that's that's what you want numbers to return on investment however what what you started to see was more people going into it and resulting in very kind of boring products that you then end up having to put on discount or frankly burn. Mm. So we started to see um, uh, uh, investable smaller groups of communities and, uh, and the idea of well, how do you invest with impact really um, picked up and what we were doing in Vietnam we didn't we didn't think about this mishmash but what we started to see was the fact that when you start to let's say invest in a in a group of artisans, mm. um, that craft and that artisanship actually helps them to um, have a secondary income for their farm. Mm. And farming is critical for everyone, right? It goes into our body. And so that enabled the farming husband or the, uh, the, the male community to actually think about how they can farm better without, without too much chemical, et cetera. So we saw this, this sort of the, the, the um, symbiotic impact and then we said, well, well, what if we started to think about investing in communities mm. so it raised the livelihood? Mm. And how would that impact education to kids? Because we were participating and donating to, to scholarship, et cetera, but we didn't see the, the result. But then when you, when you started to see parents, the craft mom and the farming father having more income, having more time, they spend it with their, with their children in their education. Mm. So you start to see this, this really build beautiful up. build up in the pyramid and you said, okay, now how do we start to track it? How do we start to really, and then I met Leo. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so from farmers to fashion, I guess, like, I mean, and we're, we're talking about investment. Who's investing in their future, our future by using your platform? You know, we who, work who with some yeah. very, uh, I want to say, innovative brands, mm. courageous maybe, uh, in the uh, food and agriculture sector. I in fashion, you'll see brands like Vans and the North Face uh, publishing their supply chain mapped all the way down to, I think, the suppliers of the suppliers of the suppliers who make uh, the clothing they sell. And you'll see it mapped on our website, on Open Source Map. Um, you know, these are companies that have decided to step ahead of the pack. Right? This is not yet required. Uh, and they've said, look, I, I want to connect with consumers who care about how their products are made. So I'm going to go do the research, talk to my suppliers, make sure they're you know, certified and that they live up to the standards that, that we're proud of, and then, and then publish that on the internet. And, and they're really looking for that connection uh, to, to the new generation of consumers. It, yeah. Is it a scary process? To get a gazillion dollar brand to look at their supply chain, <laughs> or do you, or is it more of a, a, a liberating process? Like what what goes through a brand's mind? Look, I think at this point, uh, if you don't know your supply chain all the way down to the raw material, you don't really know your business, mm. and and it's keeping people up at night. So, it's true that in the beginning, they're, they're going to discover some things that they probably didn't want to know, uh, but there's absolutely no way that they're going to fix those problems unless they discover them. Uh, and then once they do start to fix them, what they're finding is, you know, the, the alignment is there, right? Employees want to work for brands that, that have a, a conscious, a responsible supply chain. Mm -hmm. uh, marketing wants to tell the story of how the products are made. Uh, finance wants to make sure that mm -hmm. they're not wasting any material along the way. So there's, there's actually a whole bunch of uh, ancillary benefits that emerge. Uh, but usually it starts with someone at the very top saying, enough of this, we're going to get to the bottom map our supply chain so we can sleep at night and know exactly where to focus our efforts. Good. That brings me to economic impact. Uh, but, but, oh, I mean, do you want to continue? Yeah. Before yeah. that, the, the, the thing is that it's a, it, we think it's a scary process because the supply chain is like a dragon that keeps moving <laughs> into cheaper and cheaper places, right? And you're like, oh my God, just to think about the currency exchange rate, we're, we're not sure how to price our product if it keeps moving. But in actuality, all your data is already there, right? As, as a, a former fi finance person, I know that when you look at, you, when you look at this clean P&L, there's all these numbers and data that's, that's behind it. If you just 
take some of your vendorship data, you can put pretty much piece together that the, the um, let's say the fundamental or the foundation for your supply chain right there. Then, then coordinate that into, into something like a source map. Then you have a visual uh, summary of the supply chain that with the where you can start to think and strategize. The problem with mapping, I think, for most people is that you know you see all the little pieces that go. It's fascinating. You have to check that out on onto uh, on Source Maps um, website to to see all the nodes and everything. But what it does is when you step back, you you start to think and, and, and strategize where you can start to move your investment and your ideas. Because what, once you're able to have this visualization, then you can start to, to uh, manage your risk much better. And, and the problem is that in the supply chain or in a business, the person who's looking at procurement or merchandising or the supply chain isn't thinking about, well, what's the problem with the strategy? What, how are we going to strategize our sourcing for, for three months or three years out or five years out? They're looking at, can we get this product in yeah. by this particular deadline? And so you have this continuation of, of what I call leakage. And that's very costly. Mm. But if, if, if leaders um, who are investing in, in, in the fashion world are stepping back and saying, wow, maybe I really take a look because there's probably some opportunities for cost reduction without people or headcount reduction because your processes are leaking money, that's something mm -hmm. sh that should be considered. Mm -hmm. And that's a very important tool, so not just to track um, what's going on, uh, let's say for your social or moral responsibility, but really what's going on for your fiscal mm -hmm. and fiduciary responsibility. So fiscal responsibility in your, and what you do fiscally with your communities in Vietnam is really compelling and exciting. Can you tell us a little bit about the 0% loan structure that you've set yeah. up and how that's empowering people economically through your supply chain? So, so it's, it's, it's in some sense part of the supply chain, but it, it's something that's, um, that's sort of ancillary to it. We um, started a, um, the Center for Economic Development and uh, Cultural Preservation. And it's basically an NGO in country. And, and, and the reason why you have economics and, and culture together is because in really in any world, but particularly the, the, the developing world, culture goes hand in hand with economics. If that artisan, if that artist don't have a livelihood, mm -hmm. guess what? He's going to go burn some trees. Yeah. <laughs> and it actually ties very closely to environmental impact mm. because if, if they can't have a way to provide for their family yep. through their craft, through their farming, they, they're going to they're gonna look for, for natural resources, yep. if you will. So from a standpoint of, of seeing them as being a very important community in the fight against against climate change, et cetera. We have to think about their, their craft and their, their economic empowerment. And how we do it is to say, look, you're a craftsman, you're a farmer. What is it that you need to, to, to sort of tap into trade? Right. It's like no other. Mm -hmm. It's equipment, it's um, seed, it's, it's working capital. And so we saw an opportunity to provide for 0% loans. And what? And how do they get paid? And how does that? So it's 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 actually a, a pretty um, sizable loan from from ten to twenty thousand, right. and it's big equipment within the community. Somebody has to be sort of like the CEO of the group, if you will, and then they have three years to actually pay it forward. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we do it pay it forward structure is is number one, um, the idea is to build out community. Number two, the idea is to build out the the supply chain. So. In that sense, they will then teach someone else the skills so that we have a bigger impact and a bigger network of, of both potential workers and entrepreneurs. We don't have much time left, so I want to get one question left to you both because it's an important one. What are the biggest challenges right now that are happening in sustainability that you can address with the supply chain and with what you do, with both of you do? Yeah. Sure. Uh, it's a big you know, question. It's a big question. It's, it's fun because we get to work on these big problems, but yeah, you're right. I, you know, we, we know that. Uh, there's a lot of great technology. You can look at a forest with a satellite and know if there's deforestation happening. Uh, but what's uh, really the tough nut to crack is livelihoods. Right? Uh, our customers want to know that the people working in the farms, in the mines, in the factories have uh, sustainable livelihoods and that they're going to be able to continue uh, doing the work they're doing. And that's, so that's really the cutting edge for us is, is actually measuring income, access to education, access to resources for women, access to, to worker health and safety. 
And, uh, and I'd say that's really the, the next level. We've tackled the environmental issues on a lot of levels in factories. Mm -hmm. Now it's time to go to, to the ground, to, to, the, mm -hmm. to the artisans, to the farmers, and make sure that they're living well. Oh, I see it. That's why we. That's why we use handling here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> your source map, and we'll. You guys we work continue. together. Yes, we, we, we use it yeah. to, to ah. track it, right? Um, but but I think that the uh, deeper still is this ancillary um, um, impact of how did that family now have a let's say education fund. Did did that cre did that help bring bring their children to school? How many, et cetera? And I think that all of that we have the data, and we'll just loop it onto onto source map to so we can have a visualization of it. Well, you guys are that'd doing, be exciting. Yes, you guys are doing such incredible work, and I can't wait to follow you more. Can you tell our viewers how to follow you and get connected with you? I'm at Landy at fashionforfreedom.com. Okay. And I'm at uh, sourcemap.com. Uh, wait, what's the first? <laughs> oh wait, no, just kidding. I'm we're not, gonna, at we're not gonna give his email out. <laughs> we're not gonna give his email out. Although I um, thank you everybody for coming to join us with these two absolutely brilliant people who are really changing the world, focusing and changing the way we look and interact with the triple bottom line. They're incredible. Hope you connect with them and we will see you next time. Thank you for joining us here at Future Thinker. I'm Patrick Duffy.